Come on in, Facebook. Amen. This is a day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. This is Apostle Brinson and the Brinson Connection coming to you all the way from the United States of America. We're excited about what God is doing in our lives. Amen. So we want to go and get into our lesson for today. Hope all is well with you that are watching us, uh, that are watching us each and every uh, Wednesday uh, at this hour from 2 to 3. We come in and we share uh, from the Word of God. We have a little technical difficulties, I see. So, uh, hope it is straighten itself out. Amen. So, hope it straighten itself out. Well, uh, reading today. From our text, our text, our scripture text today comes from the Sunday School lesson. Those of you that study Sunday School lessons weekly and you uh, use the International Sunday School Lesson series, we use that series and the commentators from that. We had a great Sunday School lesson. Some of you all ought to call in and be with us live on our conference call. You'll have a great time just sharing with us every Wednesday from 1030 to 12 and then we come on again at one o'clock two o'clock uh, with some of the excerpts from the lesson so we're going to read from Ezekiel chapter 37 Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 21 through 28 and say unto them verse 21 thus said the Lord God behold I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen whether they be gone and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and I will cleanse them so they, so shall they be my people and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them and they shall live one and they shall have one shepherd. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land, of, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. That's three generations. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. So that's the text from Ezekiel 37, verses 21 to 28, and our key verse is my tabernacle, verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and he shall be my people. Well, we're so glad again to come to you with this excerpt of the lesson for the study for today. Uh, those of you that are joining us in by Facebook Live or either by Twitter or either by YouTube, either one of those three. We're excited about what God is doing with us and all over the world. Those of you that have been inboxing us and telling us how great the lesson is, we want you to continue to pray for us as we continue with the Brinson Connection each and every week. Well, as I get started, Bishop Stearns, God bless you. Pastor V, Adjutant General, God bless you. Brian, uh, Elder Brian, God bless you. This passage of scripture from Genesis 37, 21 to 28 comes 
on the end of Ezekiel 37.1. Most of us are familiar with Ezekiel 37 because we're familiar with the story of the dry bones. The dry bones and God spoke to the wind and the bones came together, bones to his bones. Well, after that section, this verse, the verses 21 through 28, is the next part of that 37th chapter of God telling and giving a prophecy to Ezekiel that he's going to bring both nations, both nations, that's the, both, both Israel that have a split. Judah was split in captivity with Babylon, and Israel was split, the ten tribes were split when they went to Assyria captivity. And here the prophet is prophesying that he's going to bring both of them back together and put them in their own land. So that's the nature of this story. Now, some of the scholars differ and what they claim. Some of them see this as a prophetic insight to the children of Israel, them coming back, leaving Babylon and coming back unto the land and later Israel people being free and becoming one. Others see this bigger than that. See it as both and. They see it as this is a prophetic word to the millennial reign. For those of you who have studied Revelations, then this would be the millennial reign of a thousand years reign that we shall reign with Christ 1,000 years. And, and those who have died in the Lord, those who were died as leaders in the faith shall be together with those persons who have been resurrected, uh, that have been resurrected from the tribulation period and those that have sustained themselves and washed their robes along with the 24 elders will live and reign with God, with Jesus for 1,000 years. So this there's some scholars see is that. And others say, well, no, this has something to do with the new heaven and new work after death and hell is cast into the lake of fire. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And then Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven, the bride adorned for husband. So there becomes a new Jerusalem that hangs suspended in the clouds of the new earth and nations go in and up, in and out of Jerusalem, which is the tabernacle of the place where God dwells where Christ dwells. So, you know, depending upon the scholars and where you see it, I'm just giving you information. Note then, this uh, prophetic uh, reference could be for uh, some of those who say this is, has relationship with Babylon and the children of Israel coming out, the children of Judah uh, coming out, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin coming out of the land and going back to the, going back, uh, after they were spending 70 years in Babylon, one, or this is a, a prophetic word to the both of the children of Israel and Judah and Benjamin coming out of captivity and the temple is rebuilt and restored. Or, because you know Herod destroyed the temple after it was rebuilt and the nations were back. Or this has something to do with the millennial reign because he said it's going to put David on the throne. Or this has something to do with the new Jerusalem coming down out of God, out of heaven. Or both the millennial and the new Jerusalem. So based upon who you read, based upon your school of thought, you would interpret this passage of scripture in a certain kind of a way. So I want to lay that foundation out there. Sister Barbara Davis, Apostle Davis, uh, my son, uh, Kofi, I see you on the line. God bless you. Uh, O'Neal, my nephew, God bless you too. So, so I want to lay this text out to you so you can get an idea of this last half of the Ezekiel 37 text. Because this is talking about once the prophetic word of prophesied to the bones, I will stand them up and put them in their own land. Once we have that, now we see now that and the 21st verse is talking about, I'm going to gather you. I'm going to gather you back to your own land. So let's kind of look at the text and let's break it up. I was so excited because there were so many things uh, in this text, but so much background to the text. Let me start with the background in the text. Let me talk about the context of this lesson. Uh, you know, the children of Israel, the children of Judah, they were taken to Babylon. But some of you all may not understand that there were three deportations of the children of Israel, the children of Judah. The children of Judah was taken to Babylon, but there were three times that the Babylonian king came and got them. 
Now they were taken to Babylon because of their sins, because their sins of, of idolatry and uh, also the sins of detestable things. Now detestable things were and still are anything that is an abomination. Now note this, note this. The verse 23 says, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. I want to take a moment now, and I want to split up these three. What we have is idols and idol worship and idolatry. We have detestable things, and we have transgressions. Now, the idols was idol worship. The worship would for Baal and all the other worship, the worship, the idol gods. There was a lot of different religious groups. For somehow the children of Israel had a had an issue with Baal. Baal was a fertility god and was dealing with a lot of promiscuity and had to deal with sexuality and all those issues. So you could understand why the children of Israel, they always was going to horn after Baal. They were always after the bell, going back and forth at the bell. Go back and read the book of Judges. You will see it all the time. Okay, the bell cycle. Then they cried unto the Lord, and the Lord delivered. Then they went back to Baal. Then Ahab go marries Jezebel, the high priestess of the Baal cult. They kills the 450 prophets. So, I mean, with her 450 prophets and kills the Lord's prophets. So there's so many different things as it relates to Baal and idolatry. You know, go back. Children of Israel, they come to the Red Sea, right? They come to the Red Sea. Miriam gets her tamarind. They jump and shout. Moses goes up into the mountain. He takes too long, so they say. So what happens? Aaron, which is his brother, which is supposed to be one of the leaders, fashions a golden calf and say, these be, these be the God that brought you out. Now, oh my, come on now. They had just went through the Red Sea. They had just served 400 years in Egypt. They had just got through the Red Sea. They waiting on Moses. He's not back yet. Now they want a God that they can serve and they build the golden calf and say, this be our God. You know, children of Israel, ooh, buddy. God said, you know what? I'm tired of y'all. <laughs> then he would turn around and make up with them. Then they would act crazy again. Then he would make up. They would throw their sons to the fire, Molech, all of those. And they continued to worship Idol God. God said, oh, okay, you're going, you, you're going, you're going, be, I'm going to judge you. You're going to Babylon for 70 years, so you might as well get ready, get, go get married, stay there, you know. They said three things. So they're idols, number one. Number two, uh, detestable things. The detestable things was any and everything that God said in his word is abomination. Now, I know this is Black Pride Month. Anything that the scripture said is an abomination unto the Lord is called a detestable thing. So the children of Israel, they just, they didn't care. It was an abomination to the Lord. God said, don't do it. It's an abomination. They did it anyway. They did it anyway. And then anything that has to do with transgressions. Transgressions is things that you do against a person, a place or a thing. Transgressions is when you wrong somebody. When you do somebody wrong, you transgress against them. Transgress. Transgression is acts and activity against a person or against the rule of relationships. Detestable things are any things that is listed in God's word as an abomination. And then idol worship is anything that we put before God and worship it in the place of God. So therefore, now when we look at that, the children of Judah, they, the children of Israel had already been, when the tribe split under Solomon after Solomon's reign, the children of Israel had already been taken into captivity and their land wiped out by the Syrians. So Judah and Benjamin, which was together, they continued and Levi, they worked together and then they were taken in captivity by the Babylonians for seven years. But there were three different times of deportation that they were taking. So let's look at this, get this history together. In Ezekiel chapter 1 through uh, chapters 33, we see that Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. So that was about uh, 586 BC. Ezekiel talks about that. That destruction and the exile, that was when they came in and destroyed the temple, burnt the temple, burnt the walls, 
and burn it with fire. They burned it in and they took everybody that was left to Babylon. But there were two deportations before that. Now let's note this, let's note this, because you know, in all my study, it didn't dawn on me that there were three levels of people. Three levels of people in the nation of Israel that God, in the nation of Judah and Israel, in the nation of Judah that God judged. Three, three levels. So the first level of exile uh, was in 605, 605 BC. The first group of people that the Babylonians came and took, they took the king. You remember they took the king and his sons. They killed the sons and gorged out the king's eyes and they took the top smart prize people of the land to go serve in the courts. So the first of these came Daniel and his friends. They were taken captive to Babylon. You read that in 2 Kings 24, 1 to 2. And Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. So Ezekiel relocation to Babylon became part of the second deportation. The first deportation was the king, the sons, the princesses, all of those who were smart and educated and trained the hierarchy of Judah. That's why you remember, remember in Daniel it says that the king said, let's find some people that was good looking, smart and intelligent that they may train in the ways of the Chaldees. These were smart, educated, intelligent people. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel was of those of those, and then they end up being 10 times better. See, you cannot let people, you know, one of the things I found out in our communities and our churches, when you do something, you work hard, you get at something, and you on the top, you draw haters. Yes, you do. You draw haters. People don't like you because you think you all that. You need to tell people, I am all that. I met life. I've done some things in life. I work for my stuff. I'm smart. I'm educated. I'm trained. I hung with the right folk. And so, you know, sometimes the people of the world and others, they want them kind of folk on their jobs. They don't want to know anybody. So the first thing that happened when the Babylonians came to take uh, of Judah, they took the top, the top, the top of the tent, the top of the class, the king and all the rich folk, the smart folk, the good looking folk and those who had money, those who were smart. They took them. That was in 605. Well, you would think that the children of Judah would start acting right. No, no, no. They didn't get, they just kept on acting crazy. So then they came back. They came back. Babylon came back down to Jerusalem after they had taken all the things of the house of the Lord and all the money in the banks and all that. They came back and uh, they got another 10,000, 10,000 of the elite citizens. That would be the middle class. They came to get the middle class folk now, about 10,000. They were taken in 597. So if the first deportation was in 605 and you're counting backwards, 597, that would be seven years later, Babylon comes back down to Judah and take 10,000 of the elite. And guess who was in that group? Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a high ranking priest of one of the high priest families. Before he became a prophet, he was a priest. So he here is a part of that 10,000 of the middle class, the priests or the preachers, the apostles, the bishops, the elders, the religious leaders and the community leaders, the judges and the doctors and all the those kind, the middle class, um, middle class. They came and got 10,000 of them and took them back. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 24. Verse 12 to 14, read that, read that. They came back. And so Daniel and, and the Jews was taken away to save and serve in the king's court. Then they came back and got another 10,000 of the middle class and the priest community and took them. Now, that's when we read about uh, Ezekiel finding himself captive by the river of Shabar. And as he's the second deportation. And then in um, 586, about nine years later, they go back and they get the last people of the land. They wipe out the land. They get the last people that were in the land and they burn, destroy the temple, burn it with fire and tear down the walls. 
Okay, so that but that was the process. So you got it now. So Ezekiel coming out of the middle class community and one of the out of the high priest religious families is now getting he's in the land of Babylon now. God is calling him to be a prophet. Now that's strange because somehow people teach that because you save and love the Lord that you don't go through things. Because you got a hierarchy with God. Hallelujah. The devil can't touch you. No, no, no. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they was in Babylon. Huh, huh, uh huh, huh. Ezekiel comes, he's in Babylon with the priests and the Levites. They, they, get, they get arrested and taken. And then the rest of the folk get taken. So it's out of that context that the book of Ezekiel, we're in our study. And so the men, most of the people begin to feel like what God had left them, the temple is destroyed. They can't work with God no more. He don't like them. And they dried up. They've been taken away and they're frustrated. So it's out of that, that Ezekiel gets a prophetic word. And we see Ezekiel 37 of the prophecy of the dry bones. We say our bones is lie. We cut off. And so not out of that, Ezekiel in the land with the people, Feels the hearts and minds of those who are disenchanted, but yet at the same time believes God and at the same time finds out that the presence of God is also not only because the temple was destroyed. That don't mean that the presence of God is gone because he's not dwelling in the temple or the tabernacle because he finds out that God still talks. God is talking to him in Babylon. Yeah. Daniel had the gift and anointing of interpretation of dreams. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo, they still serve God in Babylon. Can you still serve God in a negative situation? If you get arrested and go to prison, you get arrested or you lose your job or you lose your house. Are you in a negative way? Can you still serve God? Is Christ is the answer? Is that song still clear to you that Christ is the answer? In the midst of the vicissitudes of life, can God change your attitude that you move on a higher altitude and out of that you gratitude serve God because of the multitude of his blessings that still is on you even though you are in a captive state and a negative state of life and living, somehow you can feel the anointing and the presence of God and he talks to you and he gives you a word. This is the kind of lesson that we're talking about as we look at this, this scripture here, here and, and, and out of that process to know that God is still God. Whether the temple has been destroyed or not, the children of Israel, they start learning. So they learn how to create the synagogue. That was where the synagogue came from. They got together. Their temple was destroyed. That was the, set, the place where God was. And so as out of that, Ezekiel and Daniel both hear word from the Lord. Ezekiel along with Daniel, who was older than Ezekiel, but yet as far as when it came down to going down, Daniel was in Babylon of nine years before Ezekiel got there. And God was still working in the life of Daniel in Babylon while he was still talking to Ezekiel before he was captive, still in Judah. And when he left and came, because he was a priest serving the priesthood in Judah before the, this temple was burnt down with fire, so when he got to Babylon, he cried while on his way by the river Chippah, God began to speak to him. And as a Levite priest moved him and promoted him to a prophet. Oh, wow. Somebody said, I got promoted to another level of ministry while I was in a negative. <laughs> That's something, isn't it? Look at that. That's something. While you in a negative, God promotes you anyway. Now, most people say, no, see, you saying something wrong and you shouldn't did this. Well, how are you going to be this and this? And all of a sudden, God going to make you a prophet and you ain't even got no job. I mean, you know, people will come up with all kinds of things. Gifts and calls come without repentance. God do what he want to do. So Ezekiel is a priest. He comes out of the priestly family. He's up there. He's got something. He's got something. He's got money. He's got connection. And as a priest in a high priest family, he's in the, in the upper crust of his community. So he probably was the middle class. He was more upper class than middle class, but flowing in that. And out of that, he gets taken into captivity. But at the same time, while on his way to be captive, in captivity, God speaks to him and moves him from that of a priest to a prophet. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to somebody. Apostle Higdon, God bless you. I'm talking to somebody. Uh, Brother Eugene, God bless you. I'm talking to somebody, Dr. Eloise. Somebody in the midst of your negative, 
God gives you a new assignment. Wow. 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 And so I want to look at that. So I want to look at that. So I want to deal with the context of that. Let's look at the context. And so he's saying, now I'm going to bring you together in Israel and you're going to live for me in another kind of a way. I wanted to kind of, there's so many things that I saw in this lesson that I, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, highlight it. I already talked about the detestable things, you know. And so right now, you know, even in the church and our communities, we always talk about, I talk to some of my people. Now, I know I'm talking to people all over the world. So, I, I, you know, I'm not only just talking to my people in the United States of America. Thank God for all of those who are in the continent of Africa and the various nations in there and those who is on the continent, those who from Japan and China and India and Europe, all over where we are being watched all over the world. Uh, we, we are gracious. And so you may need to take this text and apply it to the situation of your people and who you are. Because one of the things that God had to deal with was to let Ezekiel let them know that if you sin and do things wrong, you're going to be held accountable. And you're going to be held accountable as an individual, but also you're going to be held accountable as a nation, a group, or a corporate. See, there's a corporate sin or a group sin as well as individual sins. Let me say something about that because people say, well, no, I didn't do nothing. You're right. That might be a sin because you didn't do nothing. One of the things, when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Jesus becomes your savior and you say you love God, then the, 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 the premise is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind and all thy strength. And the second commandment is greater and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You cannot love God and have a relationship with God and be in uh, a disarray with your neighbor. That's a conflict. No, no, no. The more you are in tune with God, the more you are in tune with others. Jesus said, when you pray, say our father, and most of you all pray, my daddy. No, see, God is my daddy. God just talks to me. Only, only I, no, 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 ain't no, 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 no. Oh, no, see, God talks to me. He don't talk to you. God, don't, no, so God has no, well, God told me, I don't care what you say, God told Oh, so if God, big old God can tell you something that affects the body of Christ, but he can't tell those who are being affected by what you've been sent to do? I think not. So there's a community. And within covenant is community. You cannot have covenant without community. You cannot be in relationship with God and not be in relationship with God's people and the people who God loves and the people who God deals with. So are you, we, we're created as relational people. We are relational by our creativity. So when you're in isolation and alone, you get prepped. You know, you get upset, you get depressed and frustrated because you were not created to be an isolated person. It was, that was not the purpose of your creation. Your creation was to be in relationship. Even one man was created to be in relationship with man. So how you, I don't need no man. I, I, the men, I don't need no one. Oh, that's so, that's, I don't need no mom. I don't need no dad. I don't need nobody. Well then, so you just all stuck on yourself and the person gets stuck on themselves just because you stuck on themselves don't change what God does because you stuck in yourself and ignorant to relationships does not put you in a position to exempt you from not being judged based upon your ignorance of the fact that you should be in some kind of relationship and constantly improving on that relationship. And so there's corporate sin, corporate iniquity, and there's individual iniquity. But individual iniquity uh, uh, moves corporate iniquity, and then corporate iniquity affect individual iniquity. So there's certain things as individuals that messes us up because we don't hold each other accountable. So if I'm a body, I'm a brother and a sister in Christ and I love Christ and I see my brother and he's not and I don't hold him accountable, then I'm in the sin to the relationship because I need to hold him accountable because sometimes based upon our relationship, what another person does affects another person. Then sometimes the systems that we created are so jacked up that they produce the process of not being accountable. Well, you can have a law, but if you got enough money, you're above the law. 
It don't affect you. So, you know, so the system is set up. So the systems we create out of relationship sometimes turn around and be the very systems that we use to not be in relationship. So it's out of those contexts that the children of Judah found themselves and yet they were going to Babylon and it was out of that setting that Ezekiel comes with the 37th chapter of bone being connected bone to the bone. Y'all can take that and throw it, stand you up and put breath in you and spirit in you and then say now and and and, and the verse 21, now I'm going to put you in your own land. I'm going to get you up out of here. The diaspora. So now this prophetic passage I would say most scholars would say this is, is, is something that dealt with what the children of Judah was going through during that time, but it has a prophetic dimension in it to deal with any nation or group of people who find themselves uh, uh, depressed and, and subjected to tyranny and all those kind of things. So it's applied. The prophetic uh, symbolisms and things are applicable to where you are. So if you're in a nation or a group of people or a community where I've always been heard and you things are not going right for you, you've been oppressed or whatever, and yet you've been challenged to serve God. And for some of you all, you got to pay a price for serving him. This prophetic uh, uh, word also offers to you some comfort. So we need to take a look at that. We need to look at that, Sister Brenda. We need to look at that, uh, 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 Brother Terrell, and see how that fits within the context. So I wanted to bring that out to talk about uh, those things. And there were some other areas, so many areas in the text. So many areas in the text. Boy, I got going and I didn't even turn and put my, my, my timer on. So I don't even know what time or how much time I got left. But that's all right. I'm going to go ahead and go with it until I finish. So, Brother Marvin, so that, 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 that's what it is. Types and shadows. Somebody that's listening to me, uh, I don't have a clock. T text me uh, what time it is right now so I have an idea of how far I'm going. Somebody ought to text me where you calling from. Somebody need to hit the share button. Hit the share button since I got people. Hit the share button. Bring some people on with you now. Somebody text me the time and where area you calling from. Text me from the time so I know what time it is in my mind. And then uh, we're going to continue. Hit the share button. We're going to continue in this lesson. Now, one of the things that uh, is 2.36, Brother Terrell, that's Chicago time. Okay, so that means I, I thank you. So I know how to set my clock. So uh, it's 2.36. Well, Brinson, you know, we got, we, we, we got uh, about uh, 25 minutes left. Okay, good. Okay, so thank you, sir. Okay, so now, now, one of the things that, wow, it was so much in this text. So much in these scriptures, I don't know about you, I get excited because when you study God's word and you study and you study God, not only you see things in the text, but also God give you revelation too. I am sure that as you that watch me on a regular basis know that I try to do a deep study of the word and my presentation to you is to get you thinking. You may not agree with me 100%. But at least you need to go Google it, do a fact, a fact, F-A-C-T check. Go check on my stuff that I present. Go, go get some books and some commentaries and a pray about what I say and get you going. I, my, my job is to get you going, get you thinking. I'm like Paul. I'm going to bring you into the school of Tyrannus and I want you to, uh, to look at the text, you know, because I'm finding out, you know, I'm 71 years old. I've been in church all my life. And sometimes I read scripture. Now, I've been to seminary. Yes, I've been to seminary. We have our own school. We've graduated over 400 students. Whole Bible and Student Seminary, known now as the Brinson Institute of Kingdom Leadership and Development. And we have 50 satellite schools in our consortium. So I'm educated. I'm a scholar. I'm trained. I read. I study. But you know what? In all that that I've got, in all my getting, I still got to get an understanding of the text. And so I'm, as I read with all my education, with my four doctorate degrees and all that stuff and the training that I have, yet, you know what? Every time I pick up the text and read, I find something new. I find something endeared. I find a, I, I, there's a deeper revelation of the text. And then I find a contradiction from the way I was trained. Ah, and then I also find a contradiction in the way I was brought up. Because, you know, we didn't went to church. They told us certain things. 
They told us certain thing, had us believe in certain thing. Then some of us that went to Bible college and seminary, we studied and we read certain books and we got certain things that we, so no, we read, we studied this, but you know, that I've learned that there are different schools of thought. I don't care how many books you got and how many things you read. The question is what book of thought or what, just like the book of Revelations, the interpretation of the book of Revelation, they're different, they're four different schools of thought. Yeah, four different schools of thought in looking at the book. So, you know, based upon, you know, information, you can always take the Bible and, and, and prove your point if that's what you're trying to do, you know. But it's something about the fact that no matter, much, no matter how smart you are, how many degrees you have, how anointed you are, how gifted you are, how much revelation is in you, that every time you read the text, God got something new, something deeper, something broader that you see in the text either literal or symbolically. Wow. That gives me excitement. That gives, that makes me excited to, to see that. And so those of you that turn to, that come on with me every Wednesday from two to three to the Brinson Connection as me being the Apostle Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III, the Dean, and those of you that scroll Facebook and having to catch me and see my teachings on Facebook, uh, and those who are subscribed to our YouTube channel. So every time I go on YouTube and ask them, you get a notification because after we teach, we also download uh, these teachings to our YouTube channel. We got over 200 teachings. On. But in the midst of all of that, as I talk to people, as I share with people, as I discuss with people, and as I reread and read scripture, new revelation, new revelation, new revelation, new concepts, new, new ideas. That's why it's always good as, well, Brinson, I read scripture. I read, I read, I read. Okay, but scripture is also not only just for you to read. Scripture is also good for you to read in groups, to study in teams, to study with people. You know? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So some of you all need to get a good study group together. You need to get, well, Brinson, I'm deep. I'm, I'm real deep. And then when you talk to people, I'm like, uh, because in all your deep, and all your revelation, you have not been able to sensitize yourself how to communicate that revelation to people that you're around. So when you start talking out of your essence of being alone, they see you as an oddball because you, you, you have to learn how to take what you knew, what you know, and put it in a language for people to understand. And when the Holy Ghost is a part of something, people hear things in their own language, what God has to say. So when you are knowing it, God gives you the power and the fortitude and the strength to explain his word to people where they are so that they can understand in their own language. And so therefore, sometimes because of where you are, what you do, how you teach, how you train, you have a, a plethora of people on different levels. So you have the educated those who've been to school, the doctors and the lawyers, they think from one perspective. Then you have those who are kind of educated, been to a little bit of school, some unknown. Then you got people that, you know, they barely can read and understand the text, but it's something about their spirit. They can understand it from because it's spiritual. So you got people at different levels of comprehension and cognitive and cognitivity that as you talk, you have to ask God to give you the anointing to be able to give something to everybody that comes to the table. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that, Sister Brenda. I'm excited about that, Sister Hodges. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. That. So ask yourself the question, God, in all of my getting, help me, God, to know. I know what you are saying. So now that I know it, give me an understanding. And if anybody lack not wisdom, let them ask of God. But before I can get to the wisdom, I got to get to the understanding. Because wisdom is the application of understanding based upon what you know. So if I know something, do I understand it? Now, once I have an understanding of what I know, how do I apply or make application what I understand based upon what I know? That's called wisdom. So if I lack it and don't have it, I haven't even asked of God. Oh, well, you know, y'all done got me going on something else. Uh, let me get back to the text. Let me get back to this lesson. Let me, let me, I saw so many things. Um, one of the things in this text is we find out that God is active in the restoration process. No matter sometimes we try to restore stuff and we try, well, we need to get ourselves together. Our people need to come back to this. And that. So, 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 so the question becomes is how is God active 
Do we see God's sovereignty and him active in the restoration process of a people, of a nation, of a group? Remember, as individuals, we are responsible. But as we know do our responsibility in relationship, we become corporate. And so the corporate comes out of individuals and individuals create corporate and corporate creates systems that affect individuals and corporate itself. So the biblical text says a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. Well, I ain't in that, Brinson. That ain't me. But you hang around the ones that are detestable. So the detestable, the detestableness of their leaven is in your lump. So you act like them, or you move like them, or you talk like them, or you think like them. Whatever is detestable. You know what? God even says it in the New Testament because they, 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 they decided that they wanted to do the things that was detestable. God said, I'm going to stop my, my, you know what? Go ahead. I'm going to turn you over to a reprobatable mind that you will believe a lie instead of the truth. And I'm not going to even fight and argue with you. I'm going to turn you over. I'm just going to let you do what you want to do. You go ahead and do what you want to do. You 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 gonna reap you gonna reap the, what the negativity and you are gonna reap the essence of what you do. But go ahead and do it. God ain't mad. God ain't upset. Some of us get upset. We mad mad. God said, "I love you in spite of what you do." But I'm gonna turn you over. So now you know. I'm telling you what. It's your call. You want to repent and believe me? I'm standing here right now to take you in. You got to be born again. Well, Brentson, I was born like this. So what? And. A lot of people is born in certain ways. That's because of the biblical next. A prophet God, an apostle God, and so yeah, 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 yeah. Brent said, it wasn't born. Oh, yeah, yeah. People are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Shaped in iniquity. The DNA of the iniquity are shaping people, and they are born. So people are, are born in certain ways. They are born in certain proclivities. They are born in certain sins in the bloodline, just like they're born in the blessings. So don't tell people what they ain't born with. This is not about how they were born. It's are you born again? Ah, yes, yes, you must be born again of the water and the spirit. The water and the spirit sanctifies you to be born again. So no matter where you are, the message is you need to be born again. I mean, oh, yeah. It's not talking about. We're going to move on because some of you all, because of what you do, you know you're not supposed to do, but you choose to do. God said, I just turned you over. Yeah. <laughs> You, that's what you want to do? Well, go ahead. That ain't going to stop me from being God. That ain't going to take nothing away from who I am. You just going to have to bite the bullet. And when it comes around for you to pay the price, then then pay the price. But I'm still still here available for you. For all that sin and falling short of the glory of God. But if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, all detestable things. And so within this text, we see uh, the prophet Ezekiel saying in the midst of all your negativity and everything you've done, God said, I'm going to reach back out to you. And I'm going to restore you. And I'm going to put you back in your own land. And I'm going to release you and put you back in and, and bring you into my sanctuary and establish within you my tabernacle. God said, I'm going to do that. So this scripture that we're talking about from Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, 15 through 28 comes on the heels of Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 of the dry bones. So let's look at it. Let's take a look at it. God says, I will redeem you. I'm going to bless you. I am going in the midst of where you are. I am the active character. I create restoration. And, and, and so therefore, when you see restoration, there's an understanding that uh, something has happened that gave a rise to the need for something to be restored. Well, God said, I'm going to restore you. Well, then what is it that, that, that is out of whack that needs to be restored? Well, see, Brent, I don't even know what I'm, ooh, hallelujah, I need God to restore me. Restore you from what? Remember, there's a from what? Something needs to be restored or repaired is because of whatever is now is not what was. Or whatever is supposed to be is not what is. And so, therefore, God said, I will. I did, you know, I've punished you for your rebellion and idolatry. Yes, I'm going to get you. Oh, yes. Whom the love, who the Lord love, he, he chastens and he, he scourges. And if you can accept the chastisement of the Lord, then you're a bastard and not a son. So some of us, we, you know, we're spiritual bastards. We, we don't want correction. We don't want to be held accountable. 
We just want to be a son of God. We just want to be a man of God, a woman of God. But nobody, okay, that's bastard relationship. God said, no, no, you're, not, you're a bastard. Not son. Some of us, we just need to stop playing the role of the bastard. Can't nobody tell you nothing. Can't nobody correct you. No, you need to become a son. You need to become a daughter. You need to be able to endure the chastens of the Lord. Well, I'm because somebody told me, well, I left. I went somewhere else. That doesn't change the fact of what you do. Your ego doesn't put you in a process, but that does not change because it doesn't make the systems change anything. So, Brother Andre, hey, Tank, long time no seeing, Doc. How you doing? God bless you, man. And so we want to begin to look at, so one of the things that I was looking at, and I was like, wow, so much in the background. I wanted to make a statement also uh, from um, this whole worship temple thing. You know, I noticed, I took a note that covert, the pestilence, covert was a pestilence that came upon the world. It was a pestilence. The pestilence, the aftermath of the pestilence created an economic surge and affected relationships whereby people in the church says, I don't have to come to church no more. It affected coming together. It affected the tabernacle concept. So now the tabernacle being the place that is set aside for those who come to worship is not uh, sacredized or honored like it used to be because COVID said some of the churches and places were shut down by government and we got used to the internet and streaming live even now. You know, I, you know we have our services on Saturday. At six to eight. I was looking and saying, where the people? Where they at? Well, I get calls, Brinson, are you streaming? Why should I get up, take my shower, get in my car, and come to 8600 South Bishop and sit when I can sit in my living room in my pajamas and watch it while those who do come out do a production for me? And so, so, so the system has changed now. Because of advanced technology, the concept of the tabernacle, the, of the concept of the sanctuary being in the tabernacle has changed. And so we allow the sanctuary to be in ourselves, the sanctuary to be a part of Zoom, the sanctuary to be part of where two or three are gathered. I am in the midst of the sanctuary. But God said, I'm going to take my sanctuary and put it back in my tabernacle. Wow. Covert changed the concept of tabernacle. So in this text, in the prophetic nature of symbolism, the tabernacle has to be revisited, especially also in the revelation and the new heaven and the new earth with all this advanced technology. Uh, but the new Jerusalem coming down from, from God out of heaven will set itself in the middle of the new earth and nations shall go up in and come back out. So that means nations shall go up into the tabernacle where the sanctuary of God is and come back out. And the thousand year millennium reign, it said Jesus will come on down. He's going to come down in tabernacle in Jerusalem, in the mount, in the temple. The temple is going to be rebuilt in the mount of the temple of the tabernacle. Jesus is going to rule for a thousand years. So the tabernacle concept is coming back. The tabernacle houses the sanctuary. Oh, 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 so because of covert, go with me now, walk with me a little bit, well, Brunson ain't all about the building, oh, yes, it is about the building, it's about the building, the building is always connected to the people, because if it's not about the building, then don't go to your building, call your house, you got a house, I bet it's about the building, when people go to your house, <laughs> your house is a reflection of your personality. Your house, your apartment, and your house. Isn't your house and your apartment a reflection of those who live in it? How are you going to go to your house and your apartment and say, wow, I don't know who lives in this house because it sure ain't me. But you say that's your house? Some of you all are so frustrated. You let some of your friends come over. You got some people come and live in the house. They brought their spirit and their way of doing things. You had a meeting with them saying, no, if you're going to be in my house, me in my house, 
You're going to be in my house. This is how we live. This is how we do. My house is a reflection of how I keep it clean. Now, you know, no, no, see, no, you, you can't live with me because you mess up my house. You mess up my equilibrium. You mess up my mindset, my cognitivity, and how I feel about my, my spirit. Every house has a spirit, bears a spirit, and bears the things and essences of those who live in it. God said, I'm going to live among my people. I'm going to live among my people, which is his sanctuary. Now, but my people is going to come to a house to worship. So the sanctuary of the presence of God, where he functions in his sanctuary among his people, is now coming to the tabernacle. And so there's certain places that are anointed places. There's certain places that are sacred places. And has always been. Let's go back to Bethel. Bethel, uh, uh, Jacob, you know, he laid in a place and he had a dream and the angels were ascending and descending. He felt some kind of way. He woke up. He said, man, this was the place of God and I knew it not. It's some place where God. So Bethel was a place. Where's your Bethel? The place is the tabernacle of which the sanctuary appears. And so the issue here for Ezekiel was the children of Israel uh, their, their, their tabernacle or their building was burnt with fire. And now they was in Babylon. So what Ezekiel was trying to tell them was, even though the tabernacle is burnt down, God don't dwell in the tabernacle. He don't live in the tabernacle. He don't live in places made by hand. He don't live. I said live. He don't live in the tabernacle. He, he, he moves in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the presence where two or three are gathered, it's the presence. One person, the presence of God, the presence of God that you sense, that you talk with, that you understand, the kingdom in you, that's the presence, that's the sanctuary. But in the text, he said, I'm going to put my sanctuary in the tabernacle. Oh, y'all, come on now, somebody. Let's go back and see what it said. I read it somewhere in this scripture. It said that. It says right there, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make my covenant my everlasting covenant, and I'm going to multiply them, and I'm going to dwell, in, they're going to dwell in the land of the fathers, and they're going to dwell there, and then what is going to happen? I as my tabernacle. So therefore, let's look at it. Verse 26 and 27 of Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, it says, moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant a peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and I will multiply them and I will set my sanctuary in, in the midst of them forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. My tabernacle is going to be with you. My sanctuary. I'm going to set my sanctuary in the midst of the people and my tabernacle is going to be there. Well, Brinson, you sound like you got it backwards. Okay, well, wait, 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 all right, all right. well no, Brinson, it can't be the sanctuary. It got to be the tabernacle. Okay, well, you are. Tabernacle, tabernacle, the tabernacle. No, the tabernacle was the place. The sanctuary was in the tabernacle. How's that, Brinson? Okay, let's go back to Old Testament. Let's go back to the Old Testament. When children of Israel was in the wilderness, what was there? The tabernacle. And the cloud came and the pillar of fire came and stood over the tabernacle. The fire came, did the cloud and the pillar of cloud and the fire, they came and stood over the tabernacle. And when the pillar moved from the tabernacle, they moved. Oh, when the, I said, when the cloud moved from over the tabernacle, they moved. So they moved with the cloud. The cloud is the sanctuary that sits over the tabernacle. The tabernacle represents the symbolism of where the sanctuary comes. Oh, my God. So let's go back and see here now. Well, Bruce, I just don't see it. Well, I mean, let me read Ezekiel 37 one more time. It says, verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. I'm going to set my sanctuary. I'm going to set myself. I'm going to set myself in the midst of them forevermore and my tabernacle also shall be with them. The sanctuary and the tabernacle together. COVID said, let's separate the sanctuary from the tabernacle. That's what COVID did. 
That's just a season of time. Well, Brinson, you know, you don't have to be. All right. Okay. Well, I, you know, you know, I ain't going to argue. But, you know, it, it's I, it's something about the tabernacle and the sanctuary. You're not talking about that. You know, for some of us, we just got through watching the, the playoffs. The basketball playoffs, right? Remember that? Well, so if we're going to go with the argument, then nobody needed to go to the tabernacle. Nobody needed to, to go to the Colosseum. No, 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 no. When 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 Denver was playing, when when Denver Denver was playing the Heat, you could just stay at home and watch it on tele. You know, and nobody need to be in the stands at all. Nobody don't no nobody come. No 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 drums. No nothing. No no rituals. No celebrations. Y'all just play. Y'all y'all don't even have to go in there. Well, where I'm gonna play at? I gotta go into I gotta go into something to play. But 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 before during the COVID, they was having a problem because they said it ain't exciting when we go in to play that there's no bed, nobody there. And at one place they put pitches all around the seats. It ain't it ain't no fun to play a game of basketball and football and baseball and golf and tennis. And all the games and act, it's no fun to play and 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 go to the horse race and all that with no people. We don't need them. We don't need no people gathered. We don't need all that. Oh yes, you do. It makes a difference. There's a ritual, a celebration. There's things that go on within the tabernacle. The sanctuary is the presence. The tabernacle is where the presence of the sanctuary is. Well, Brinson, I see it the other way around. I see the tabernacle being the presence and the sanctuary being where, okay, well, they have it your way. Either way it goes, is still the point. The point is we need to, you, 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 covert messed up the process. It was already, already had, you know, way back. They said, don't forget to assemble yourselves together. As some do. So then we got to understand if my people are going to call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal the land, the land, the land, the land is connected to the people. The land and the place is connected. The rituals, the sacrifices, the rituals of how you do stuff is connected to the land. The altar, the place of repentance is connected to the ritual, which is connected to the land, which is connected to the place. Oh, well, we don't have to go to church now. We don't have to see this, see, 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 see. We don't have to come nowhere. We can, oh, hallelujah. We don't have to gather ourselves together. Here, Ezekiel says here, God said, no, no, I'm going to put my sanctuary and my tabernacle together. I'm going to do some things. So now let's look at it. So then, therefore, we must understand that God is restoring. He said, I'm going to restore and I'll put my covenant with the people. But this is going to be my process. See, people want to be in God's covenant and be in God's restoration. We want to participate in the process and the act of God's restoration. But we don't want to do it through the plan process. Now, as I look at Ezekiel, I see some things happening. First of all, he said he's going to restore his covenant with the people from the temple, from the tabernacle, from the tabernacle. I'm, I'm going to put my tabernacle there for my sanctuary. So I'm going to restore, but I'm going to put the tabernacle. Now let's go back. When Nehemiah came to build the walls, they, Ezra and them was already there. They had come to talk about the time. Oh, my time is up, but let me finish this thought process. So you can't build the walls without building the tabernacle. David said, I, you can't, I can't have my house and build my house. Solomon, build my house. There ain't no house where God is represented. Even though we know he don't live there, the representation and the symbolism of his presence need to be there for the people. And so therefore, from the temple, his covenant is going to be made from the temple. And then from the temple is the altar. The altar is where we go to repent. The altar concept is the repentance. The, the temple concept is the gathering. The altar concept is the repentance. And then the sacrificial rituals. The fastings, the prayings, the, the giving, the giving, the worship, the tithing, all of those rituals was a part of the tabernacle. And in the in the wilderness, 
They came to the tabernacle, but they brought rituals. They brought their tithes and offerings. They wave offerings, the this offering, Pentecost. All of those celebrations were rituals. The priest goes into the, the sanctuary and kills the, kills the cow, kills the lamb, and sprinkles the blood over the over the all, all that's ritual the the worship and the priestly functions are rituals the intercession going behind the veil and all that the veil is renting now but we is there still a ritual of prayer and intercession of singing and praying in tongues and in the spirit all of those are rituals so therefore we have the people from the tabernacle then the altar then the rituals the sacrificial rituals and then finally the resettlement of the land to my people all over the world, your land is jacked up. Ukraine, the land is jacked up. But, but somehow, the sanctuary of who God is comes in the midst of the people. And they say, we got to come to a place of the tabernacle. We got to gather ourselves to a place. And we need to come to the altar and repent. We need to lay ourselves before the Lord. We got to bring him worship through the sacrificial system and give him our worship, our tithes, our offerings, sing and make a melody to him what he's done. Worship him in the beauty of holiness. And we do all of that. He heals the land. He heals the land. He heals the land. So Ezekiel 37 said, I'm going to put you in your own land. Oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to cause breath to enter you. Somebody, some person that's listening to me all over the world. Some of you that represent families that are torn apart. Some of you work, represent corporate America or corporate Africa. Uh, therefore, wherever your economic systems is jacked up, your relationship and your political systems have questions and different things. Your family covenant structures are all diluted and whatever. Whatever it is, I hear God saying, I'm going to put. My sanctuary shall be there in my tabernacle. And I'm going to do some things. I'm going to heal your land. I'm going to bring you back to your land. That's a prophetic, that's a prophetic concept. And it has within it a season and time. It also has within it symbolism. And for some of us, it's actually literal. So I wanted to take that time out. Sister Francine and Sister Brenda, uh, Thomas said, about all y'all that's watching to say God bless you for this day. Remember, every Wednesday, join us at the Brinson Connection. Every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. That's in the United States of America. So all of my brothers and sisters all over the world, I greet you. I greet you in this hour. Join us in the Brinson Connection on excerpts of the Sunday School Lesson, excerpts of the Bible Study, excerpts every, every, every Wednesday from 2 to 3. Those of you that miss us, go on to our YouTube but before you that you missed us on you 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 you're part of I got over five thousand friends so if you're trying to get a friend it's you know it's just ooh. but go on our Facebook go on Facebook you own this channel Facebook channel now you can scroll back up scroll back up because I don't delete this teaching all of my teachings are on there you can scroll back up or either go to our YouTube go to YouTube and uh, you know be a subscribe to our channel it's free. And so anytime we put a teaching on, on the YouTube, it'll alert you. Go to YouTube, type in Dr. Sylvester Brinson, S-Y-L-V-E-S-T-R-B-R-I-N-S, in the third, go into our YouTube channel and subscribe. This, this teaching is also on our YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be on in a few as soon as we get off here. It'll be on a few. We have over 200 teachings on our YouTube channel. Get on there, you know. God bless you. And then every Saturday, every Saturday now, we stream live. Every Saturday, we've opened up one of our teaching centers in the, in the city of Chicago. Our headquarters, our apostolic headquarters is in Chicago, Illinois, uh, United States of America, our headquarters. And God is doing something in Chicago. We have a new mayor and uh, some things. And God is changing some things and shifting some things. And we're, we're working with those people in the Chicago community and area. And so if you in our area... Every Saturday from every Saturday from six to about seven thirty, we're teaching. We used to come on and sing, but you know, y'all, y'all, y'all know. Yeah, 
we'll come on and sing one or two songs. Our theme song is, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. This is the day. And so if you understand whatever your day is, God still made it. So let's see where God is. How is he in it? How, what kind of power, what kind of manifestation is in your day? So every Saturday from six o'clock or six, six o'clock to about seven, seven thirty, we're on streaming live from this same station that you got that YouTube. And also you can pick it back on YouTube, but we're glad what God has done. And so we're looking at what is restoration? Restoration, restoration has come. Restoration, Ezekiel 37, the restoration so the dry bones have been restored, and now the restoration of the dry bones is going to be put in a place. From restoration to placing. From restoration to placing. God will restore you. He will get you back together. He will put you back together. Put your pieces together. Stand you up and put his anointing in you, but then he'll put you in a place. From restoration to destination. That's going to be my thing, from restoration to destination, Ezekiel 37, from restoration to destination, from restoration to destination called place, uh, restoration, from restoration to, de to, to destination called place. Until next time, God bless you, may heaven smile upon you and give you peace.